But this is what, what eventually became known as entropic gravity. That name was not invented by me, but I think that the way I, I kind of like to explain it is that, that I say that entropy or the microscopic entropy that's in the, in the space time is the starting point and, and that we should then derive gravity from it or even derive, well, what we can now call space and time. So space and time themselves should be seen then as something that, that become what, what I would call emergent from a more microscopic uh, description. So this idea of emergence kind of is very central to this um, whole uh, theory of entropic gravity, is that you start from the entropy and then derive the gravitational laws instead of uh, the other way around. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 159. And this great episode is with Eric Verlind, who is professor of physics in the Faculty of Science at the University of Amsterdam, where he specializes in many topics that are currently uh, quite close to my interests and dear to my heart. So namely, what I have in mind are quantum gravity and string theory, and then black holes, which are quite close uh, to, to quantum gravity, and then cosmology. And in this episode, Eric and I discuss a number of things, but we start out by talking about his studies with the Nobel laureate, Gerard at Hoft, who seriously influenced his thinking. And then we talk about black holes and the holographic principle, which uh, Gerard at Hoft helped to develop. And I will let Eric give a much better description of that than I can. Though you have, I mean, quite a storied career in, in theoretical physics yourself, you've also been trained by and worked with some of the greatest physicists of our lifetimes. And since I know that at least one of them was particularly influential in your thinking, I thought that a nice way to start would be be to begin by discussing your teacher, the Nobel laureate Gerard at Hoft, and some of the things that you learned from him. So he, he supervised your master's thesis in Utrecht, and then you also worked with him afterward, right? Yes. I mean, of course, I knew already about him before I went to study. I mean, I saw uh, some documentary on television where he was featured. Actually, also Stephen Hawking was in the same documentary. It was called Key to the Universe. And it was about elementary particles and about black holes. And so I knew that Gerard Hoog was a professor at the university in Utrecht. And I also was uh, growing up in that area and went to the university there to study also. And I hoped, of course, to work with him. Uh, so I got to know him when I was doing my thesis, I mean, my undergraduate thesis, which was precisely in the period when string theory came up, uh, I mean, as, as a leading candidate to describe quantum gravity. I mean, uh, I already had had classes from him. I mean, he had taught me about, well, quantum mechanics, particles, but also about black holes. But it was the subject of string theory that initially got my interest. And he, he also told me to start working on this for my, my uh, undergraduate thesis. And later in my, my PhD thesis, I continued that work. And I had a chance to talk to him about, well, his ideas, and he inspired me quite a bit. I mean, because he was someone, of course, very well known and, and already famous for all the work that he had done. I mean, he was already uh, very young as a student when he did his most important work on, on uh, elementary particles. I mean, he, he described basically how we do calculations uh, that are necessary to describe uh, the interactions between elementary particles that we now describe by the standard model. But then at that time, he already had switched a little bit of an interest into uh, studying also black holes. Uh, inspired by the work of Hawking, he questioned uh, what, what quantum mechanics and gravity would do when you bring it together. And he saw black holes as, as the main way of starting to make progress because 
it really focuses very much on the questions of what is well, the most basic object in, in, in gravity and, and quantum gravity. And he thought about the, the black hole very much as this sort of well, basic thing that we can learn from. Like we had in quantum mechanics, we had the, the hydrogen atom, the very simple atom that made, made out of protons and electrons. And he thought black holes had a very similar simple structure that we should be able to understand quantum mechanically. And he influenced me quite a bit. I mean, his way of thinking was very original, very much uh, to the heart of the question. I mean, he really wanted to solve a problem. All of his papers uh, that he wrote was always trying to truly describe everything that he could understand about a particular problem and then then leave it there and, and, and let other people then take on. But he, he always made such a progress, enormous jump in our understanding. This is what made his legacy, actually. And this is also what I saw as an example of how you do science, is really to try and understand the deepest, well, get the deepest understanding of, of what, what nature is about and, and what these physical questions are about. Like, what is black, what are black holes? What are the quantum properties of black holes? And how can we bring gravity and quantum mechanics uh, together? And, and string theory was one approach. Um, uh, at Hoft clearly did not like string theory. And he had many reasons why he sort of was uh, a, a bit skeptical about that approach. Partly because it was very mathematical, uh, also because it requires these extra dimensions. And the thing that, that he also didn't like is that, that it assumed some symmetry of nature that we now call supersymmetry, which he didn't really think was necessary to, to, to solve these problems. He, he very much thought that, that we should focus on these questions of black holes. And in hindsight, I have to say, he was very much right. I mean, there were many things that he said at the time that now have become sort of, well, mainstream, or at least have been understood by many more people and have been taken over uh, as, as elements of how we understand quantum mechanics and gravity. Hmm. Well, a few things. I hadn't realized that you were already doing string theory in undergraduate, though I know that it was part of your graduate thesis. Uh, and then what you said about Ed Hoft being a, an example of how you do science, uh, in that he, he would put everything he knew down in a paper and then help let others engage in the work. It's very different from how academia is structured today, where people are just churning out uh, papers that are very incremental interventions because that's the incentive system of the university. No, that's very good that you say this because I, I always have seen that, that um, and actually it's uh, the way, way I also continued working also with, with my twin brother Herman, who was one of the other students in Utrecht. We always saw it a, as a challenge to sort of understand the problem we were working at, at, at the deepest level and sort of write a paper that had a lot of content and not turn out, well, write very small incremental papers. And also, uh, you have to understand that Hoft is, is someone that works mostly by himself. I mean, uh, he has a very strong opinion of what you need to do, and it's not easy to work with him. And so I didn't write any papers also at the time that I was in the same department with him. Also, because we felt both that we had our own ideas, we listened to each other, we inspired each other, but we were very sort of stubborn about following our own ideas. And and I have this a little bit of the same uh, well, way of working. And so we both inspired each other without having to work together. I mean, this is one of the things that I think theoretical physicists do a lot. They talk and they exchange ideas, but it's not always necessary to really work on the same problem at the same time. You write your papers and that's how you bring out your understanding, your ideas. And, and now I think you're right. I mean, we are in a time where people, many people work together. They have papers with many authors and they sometimes contain results that are somewhat smaller and not fully to the heart of well, the, the answering all the questions that we would like to know. Hmm. No, I, I can see that this influenced you, even though that I'm, even though I'm not a string theorist, when I look at your work, I can see that it's not just incremental developments on other people's work. There are lots of big papers that spark 
their own research program. So entropic gravity, for instance, which we will um, get to soon. But before we move on to black holes, I think that this is an important question to ask. So you mentioned that Ed Hof didn't like string theory in part because it was so mathematical. But if he was so influential on you and your thinking, and particularly a bla about black holes, but now your thinking about black holes revolves around string theory. Why was it that you ended up parting from him in this way? Well, I, I thought that string theory had some very interesting elements in it. And also, I think it addressed the question quite well in an elegant way, I thought. Um, and I always felt I want to know what it's doing because it's clearly made more progress than had been done before. Uh, something I also felt was missing in, in the way we were describing the other forces uh, in the sense that, I was going to say, I mean, the, the way we described the other forces was in terms of particles and, and fields, and they had something that, that was not appropriate to describe gravity. And, and string theory did this in a better way. And I wanted to know what is what makes string theory work. And of course, uh, I was also trying to apply that eventually to understanding black holes. And I saw it more as two approaches that eventually, when you merge them together, might give us uh, the full answer. So I, I didn't want to put string theory on the side. And I felt also, as I said, I mean, there was a certain elegance. And I also kind of liked the math. I mean, I was someone that was less afraid of uh, getting into the math sides of things because I also thought we needed different language, another way of describing physics than the one that we had already developed. So this new perspective was fresh. Um, of course, it was also an exciting time when many more people were working on this. So there's a certain social way that uh, this also happens because I do see that, that an important part of how we make progress is, is sort of humans in understanding the world is also by listening to what other people are seeing. And so there's a social aspect to it. And string theory was certainly an exciting field to work in where many of these ideas were being developed. And I wanted to know about them. It's not like I, I want to be, be on the side. And so I wanted to really take part in that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this lack of fear of the math and an appreciation for elegance. When, I, when I've read about you and you mentioned your twin, Herman, I, I have read people describe you as terrific mathematicians that aren't exactly, like you said, you're not afraid of the math. And that is part of what has allowed the two of you to make such important contributions to string theory. But I also, from, from reading uh, lots of popular accounts of string theory, like Brian Greene's, for instance, I can see very much how even within physics, it is such a social field. Um, but anyway, I, I think that a lot of your work, whether it's on holography, entropy, quantum gravity, or so on, it all has a connection to black holes. And since they're an exotic object that many of our listeners are going to be familiar with already, they're a good place for us to start. So toward introducing some of these issues that I just mentioned, I'm wondering quite basically how you see black holes as connecting general relativity and quantum theory. And this, of course, brings us back to Ed Hoft and Hawking, as you mentioned, and how this might lead to some paradoxes. Well, black holes are, are, are the most, well, first of all, symmetric objects that we have in gravity, and they're also the most dense and, and extreme objects. It's where mass is sort of concentrated in such a small part of space-time that light cannot even escape. I mean, and, and that means that, that the matter is so dense that there is a certain region, a certain distance from which light can no longer escape to, well, to the viewer outside. And this creates some, some imaginary sphere around this matter that we call the horizon. So if you are behind that horizon, you cannot get out. And which, of course, already poses a question. I mean, in, in normal well, the way that Newton describes space and time, every point of space is connected to another point. You can always communicate. But in, in, in Einstein's theory, because of the curvature of space-time, suddenly it appears possible that there's a certain part of the space that cannot 
well, you cannot send light signals out. And light is, I mean, you cannot go faster than, than light. Light is the most speedy way in which we can communicate with each other. And so if light cannot get out, nothing can go out, get out. And this is why a black hole hides something behind its horizon. And, and which in a certain way is, is, is well, not satisfactory because we, we don't see anything from the outside. When we throw in matter into a black hole, the only thing we see is the mass because the mass still has a, well, a black hole still has a gravitational pull. So we can measure the mass. And, and if we throw charge into the black hole, we probably can also measure the charge still. And things like, well, the, the, the rotation, the angular momentum, we call this, can be measured, but those are the only things we know about. And and this was around the time of well, when Hof was also working on this um, description of the standard model. Hawking at the same time was thinking about black holes, and and he and others discovered that black holes um, have have certain properties that that look very much like like uh, what we normally use to describe the laws of thermodynamics. I mean, if you think about gases and and, and fluids with a the temperature, uh, they satisfy certain laws uh, that, that tell you, for instance, that uh, something that has a temperature um, and an energy, I mean, they, you can have a relationship between them. And this is where the notion of entropy also comes in. There's the first law that tells you that the change in the energy and the change in the, the entropy uh, are related um, and are proportional actually with the temperature uh, as the proportionality constant. But this actually came out also as a law that uh, was discovered for black holes. Black holes namely uh, also change their energy if you throw in mass into a black hole because of Einstein's equivalence between energy and mass. Uh, you're actually increasing the energy. And it turns out there's also an increase of what we call then the entropy. So the entropy in thermodynamics should be thought about as a measure of, of how much information, of how much microscopic information is necessary to describe uh, a, a microscopic system. Well, for a black hole, we don't know what's inside the black hole. It turns out that there's some way that we can still count how much information is inside the black hole, which is uh, we, this entropy. And that entropy turns out to be proportional to the area of its uh, horizon. This is what Hawking discovered together with Bekenstein in, in, the, in the 70s. And, and it, in order to derive that, actually, he made use of, of quantum mechanics. So there's, it's a property of quantum mechanics that um, turns out indeed that these black holes have a temperature because that was what Hawking then showed. The idea of the entropy was actually due to Bekenstein, but Hawking indeed showed that black holes do have a temperature and that uh, quantum mechanics namely allows you to see a certain kind of radiation, sort of like a hot object is, is emitting radiation, and black holes also radiate with a certain temperature that was calculated by Hawking. And, and together, when you put the temperature together with this entropy, you have then a relationship between the, the change in the mass and the change in the entropy that's exactly this, this first law this law of thermodynamics. So this was a, a very deep discovery, and and I think it's one of the biggest discovery that was made in the last century. I mean, I really think that it was the the way in which eventually we're going to be understanding the relationship between gravity and 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 quantum mechanics. Um, although at that time we had no idea what that entropy meant. I mean, I, I mentioned that this entropy. Uh, can only be, well, explained if you know how to describe what's inside this black hole in a microscopic way because the the, the, the entropy represents in how many ways you can, can represent a, a microscopic object. I mean, if you think about the entropy of uh, a volume of where gas uh, of particles are inside, it's actually counting all the possible ways that these different particles can, can orient themselves or how they can move and their velocities. If you know where they are, if you keep that all, uh, put that all together, you get an enormous amount of information that, that somehow is then counted by this entropy. And very uh, loosely speaking, I mean, the way you can think about this entropy is 
is that if I would write down all the positions and the velocities, I would write them down in some numbers. I, I have to put this in some database with all kinds of bits. And those bits we count as zeros and ones. And if you know how many bits I need to describe all these positions and velocities, that number of bits you can think about as, as being the entropy. And so we needed something similar for black holes in order to explain what is the origin of this entropy. And, and at the time, and certainly when at Hoft started thinking about black holes, we had very little knowledge about this and very little tools even to, to address that. And this is where string theory eventually I think, well, came in and, and why indeed bringing together string theory and the study of black holes is sort of such a promising field because it's somehow uh, this question about what is the entropy of a black hole and the way that string theory eventually provided us with with a, an answer is how we now are making progress and how we now are, are trying to answer the questions that were already posed, say, almost 50 years ago. Okay, great. We've got a lot on the table. There's, But I want to unpack it a bit more just before we move on to how string theory helps us understand the entropy. And something you said right at the outset, I think we all... Uh, understand in the zeitgeist that black holes are extremely dense, but you also said that they're the most symmetric objects in the universe. And I was wondering if you could explain that. Is Does that have to do with the idea that black holes have no hair? I mean, no matter how you look at them, they're kind of indistinguishable? Yes. I mean, uh, so when, when you look at a star or a planet, I mean, you can always see features on the outside. I mean, a planet has, has mountains and all kinds of little things on it, and, and, and stars have also things happening around it. And, and so they're not, not ideally symmetric. I mean, if you think about objects that are symmetric, we think about a sphere, for instance. Or, or if you make it slightly asymmetric, it might be sort of like more an ellipsoid. But it's still very symmetric. And black holes have this property that when all of the matter has been sort of disappearing behind the horizon, that the only thing that you see is the horizon of the black hole. And, and uh, because black holes, only we know what we know about them is the mass and the charge and, and, and the way they are rotating, uh, there's only very little things you can see from the outside. And so when you look at this, this black holes and nowadays we can look at them like these super massive black holes in, in galaxies uh, their shape of the black hole itself is very symmetric it's it's like a little round or a little ellipsoid kind of uh, shape that that is then surrounded by lots of matter that does all kinds of things but the black hole itself is is very symmetric and and it has not many things we can see from the outside except its shape Okay, great. And then one other thing I wanted to clarify is, were you saying that the fact that black holes radiate is one of the greatest discoveries of the last century? Well, the radiation is one step, but the other step, which I think is sort of involved, and, and this is, I think, a more important one, is, is I think, the, the, the entropy that's associated with that. So if you the radiation itself uh, is a very big discovery. But also the the, the implement, you know, what it's implying for how we should think about black holes, and and it indeed uh, brings us to the question of of what is even space time because uh, Einstein put together the way we think about space time with gravity. He um, well showed that that gravity can be thought about as as a way of well, how space time is curving. And, and this is also how we eventually think about black holes as objects where, where space and time are very highly curved. But in order to understand this question of what is the entropy of a black hole, we have to go deeper. We have to understand even what space-time itself is made of. You said earlier that to understand the entropy of a black hole, we must understand what's going on in the center of a black hole. And we all picture black holes as extremely chaotic objects, but as you mentioned, they're at the same time extraordinarily dense and compact. And one understanding I have of entropy is that one measure of entropy is that the the more ways some configuration can be arranged uh, microscopically without affecting how we 
without affecting the appearance of the macro state than the more entropy it must have. Yet when something is so tightly compacted, there are far fewer possible micro states in which the configuration can be arranged. So I'm wondering if you can help me understand where my picture of this is wrong, because on the other hand, I also understand that because black holes have no hair, they're essentially indiscernible macroscopically. So we might also think the opposite, that no matter how they're arranged microscopically, they result in the same macro state. Yes, so so general relativity would tell you that all of the matter that falls into a black hole eventually gets squeezed up to such small distances, almost at the center of this black hole, into a point. And so you would hardly see anything of where the matter is sitting. And you might say all this information that you have sort of thrown into the black hole can be a diary or, or a telephone book uh, when we were used to that. I mean, there's a lot of things you can throw into a, a black hole and that all disappears. But what, what Hawking and, and Bekenstein told us is that this information actually kind of is stored on the horizon. And one way of thinking about it is even that, that if we are looking up how things are, are disappearing behind the horizon, when we look at it from the outside, actually, when we look from the outside, we don't see everything falling really through the horizon, we see it falling towards the horizon. Because if something falls into the black hole, the clock that this observer or this object would have would actually start slowing down. And actually, it slows down to such a point that we don't see it really disappearing after behind the horizon. So from our perspective, everything that we throw into the black hole actually it's just hovering actually very close to the horizon and it's all there. But the reason we don't see it is that the light that it's emitting cannot reach us anymore without being sort of redshifted. I mean, that's what, what happens also in gravity is that the color of light also changes because the clocks go slower. We don't see this, the, the, the light anymore that's being emitted. So it's almost black because it cannot emit light anymore that we can see. And, and so everything that is thrown into a black hole, you can also think about as actually being sort of put on the horizon and, and it stays there. And so what Hawking then tells us is that eventually all that information also has to come out. And the amount of information associated to everything that goes into the black hole is precisely proportional to that sphere on where everything is sitting. And so what we have learned indeed is that that... Um, that you have to look more closely, first of all, what happens near the horizon, but also think about the black hole as different than just all the particles that sort of had disappeared behind the horizon. It's really more about the information that's stored on the horizon. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that also in thermodynamics, by the way, you see information kind of disappearing. If we describe what happens in a room uh, if we associate uh, the gas in a room with well what we call thermal gas then we give it a temperature we give it a pressure and, and we have very little numbers that we need to describe that and then all of the the rooms with the same temperature and pressure kind of feel the same so we don't see the microscopic information either we know it's there if you think about the molecules but if you just think about the gas that gas just has very little things we see about. And so black holes are sort of similar. We only see the mass. We only see uh, the charge and the angular momentum. But, but And indeed, we can also see a temperature. But those are, are, are the microscopic uh, numbers that we see. The microscopics of what is really happening close to the horizon, we don't see from the outside if we are just normal humans or some, some observers that only look at the, at the gravity, for instance. Hmm. I had always I had always found this idea of the information contained in a black hole being stored on the outside as very unintuitive, but the way that you just described it, uh, I understand. I think I understand it much better because I think most people are familiar with this paradoxical. Well, maybe it's not paradoxical. It's at least confusing image from general relativity of an astronaut you're always told that if an astronaut goes into a black hole you'll just see them slowing down but you'll never see them enter it and 
because of that, I'm, I'm now better understanding why we would see the information about everything in a black hole on the outside of it. I'm wondering now which direction in which you think we should go. One question is how string theory comes in to solve this sort of information paradox and explain the entropy of a black hole. And then the other direction is my understanding that is that Gerard de Tuft and then Leonard Susskind were motivated to develop the holographic principle in part due to this paradox and then the holographic well, well, let, let's let's continue there I mean I think eventually we can be, go back circle back to string theory okay so so um it was indeed at Hoft I think who who was as I said thinking about black holes even ignoring what happened in string theory but he already had the idea that that black holes are special in the following way that that uh, they're not only the densest objects they're also the objects that contain the most information that you can put inside a certain volume so he said basically the following take a certain part of space inside a sphere and i want to put information inside i can do this by adding particles and and giving them properties like well, they have spin and, and they have charge and, and all kinds of things that I can count. And I can bring more particles in and eventually I'm increasing the information. But eventually when you bring in so many particles, you also, of course, the gravity comes in, you can create a black hole. And and his argument was that the most information you can put inside a, a volume is given by if you would make something like a black hole. And then we know how much information a black hole has, namely it's given by the area of its horizon. And the conclusion is kind of strange, namely that if you have a volume, which we normally think about as growing with the radius, well, in in, in a certain, well, it's it's cubed because it's like a height times mm-hmm. this, whatever it is. Width and depth. That's how, how a volume grows. It's like the mm-hmm. cube of the radius. Well, the area grows like the square of the radius. And so the, the funny thing is that, that inside a volume, I cannot put arbitrary amount of information, uh, not in every point. I mean, it, it has to be equal to the area measured in a certain unit that we call the Planck scale. It's a l- large number in general because the Planck scale is a very tiny scale. It's like, like 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. It's, it's really a small number. Uh, that that if you would count that for a sphere of this size, it would be well enormous. I don't even know how to express this. I mean, I I think the the uh, the outcome of his his argument was basically that if you have indeed uh, information inside a, a volume that goes like the area, it also means that you basically can describe everything inside of a volume by going to the boundary. And putting there all this information. So the larger the volume, eventually you will get some big sphere. But then all of that's going on inside this this volume should be described by information that's sort of projected onto the boundary of that sphere. And this is what uh, he called the hologram. Uh, it was uh, later and it's seen also by Susskind and who, who realized this this. Well, the power of this idea, and 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 that's what eventually became the the holographic principle. Uh, it was a pro- proposed uh, sort of in the middle of the nineties, and, and one of the the beautiful things that happened quite soon after that is the breakthroughs that we had in string theory. I mean, uh, at that, around that time, we started indeed understanding more about what black what the information is associated with black holes. And so this holographic idea then got indeed realized also in 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 a, in a in a setting that we could derive from string theory. So this is what made us all convinced that that um, indeed this holographic principle kind of holds, and that it's really something that's very deeply connected to how gravity and quantum mechanics uh, work together. Um, there's something else I wanted to say. Um, yeah, and indeed, indeed the, the holographic principle now, actually, actually, what I want to say actually is that it, of course, goes back to what Bekenstein and Hawking did, namely, they had their formula for the entropy of a black hole, uh, which was the area of the horizon. And, and now it became a principle that was much more 
general. I mean, it's not just about black holes. It basically says that any part of space-time, the information that I can put there must be sort of bounded by the area that, that is bounding that, that region. And and um, this this idea has, has really shaped the way we think about gravity and quantum mechanics now for already a number of decades. And, and it's leading us to sort of, well, deep insights about how, how gravity and quantum mechanics work. Okay, I would, I'd like to get back in a minute to where string theory connects with the holographic principle to help make sense of Bekenstein Hawking radiation. But first, if it's okay, I'd like to explore the holographic principle a little bit more. And just to make sure that I have it correctly, we can just in a definition, the holographic principle is that you can describe everything in a given volume with information on the boundary of a surrounding two-dimensional surface. Is that a, a good encapsulation of just what it is in a slogan? In a slogan, I think that's correct. I mean, I don't think we have a full understanding yet of what it means. We have some particular examples that we found in string theory where we even have a more more precise description uh, or definition. But you're right. I mean, so the, the, the way we think about the holographic principle is that to describe everything inside a certain volume, we can describe it information that's sort of written or, or living on that boundary of that volume. And, okay. and just like a hologram, you're basically reconstructing a larger part of the, 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 the three-dimensional space from something that's, say, two-dimensional. Okay. And then... My question, I the question that comes to mind is more philosophical, I think, here than physical, maybe. But I understand that the holographic principle extends beyond just black holes to the universe. So we could, in principle, describe everything in the volume of the universe by with information that is encoded on some surrounding two-dimensional area. And... The question that I have, if that is right, is it's one thing to say that we can describe everything in this way. It's quite another thing to say that that is the correct description of the universe and what we experience is, in fact, a hologram, that the universe, the, the volume of the universe is uh, this projection from a two-dimensional and surrounding area boundary do you think or is it argued that that is what the universe is or just uh, that I that's a possible I, I kind of like i like the way you phrased it because i think there, there would be probably many colleagues of mine that would be agreeing with the strong version that you just said that this is the way it is well i don't think it's also the the way i mean i think in practice it's not how we should think about it. It's more like a bound on the information. And it may also not be the most, indeed, and this is sort of what, what we have been working on in, in the last decades. Having everything on the boundary is not the, mo the most practical way of describing what is going on here in our universe. In, here we are talking uh, and we, we are, are, well, living our lives. And and it's very weird to think about that. That really is just some projection, some whatever reconstruction of something that's going on on, on the boundary. But but uh, the principle I think helped us understand better about what quantum gravity is, and also indeed how much information we need to describe uh, everything that's happening, say within the universe even. Um, but but I don't think it's the final way we're gonna be thinking about it. I mean, also the, the way we want to describe the physics that's, and, and everything that's going on in, in our, our experiments or our observations, having this picture where everything should be described Mike, well, on the boundary is, is not the, the, the most practical way or even the, the most maybe fundamental way of thinking about it. It's more like, um, I think, uh, um, uh, as I said, uh, an upper limit of how much information we need but also maybe something that, that I think eventually become more a feature of the, the microscopic description than, than really the way we should, well, think about it as a, as a principle. Okay, so for you, maybe the weak, the weak version of the holographic principle is that 
it's a useful tool for achieving a better understanding of whatever the universe is rather than an insight into, let's say, the fundamental metaphysics of the universe. Yes. And I think, I think yeah, raising it to a principle that, that should be really imposed on our microscopic theory, I think, is going too far. And I'm certainly one of the people that are, well, arguing a little bit against this, but I'm only one of a few people. I, I have to say many of my colleagues will probably go as far as basically saying that holography is is the most fundamental discovery and we should sort of, how that's how we should think about our universe. I, I don't think that is practical and even also fundamentally what is going on. I'm talking to your colleague Juan Maldesena in a, a, a week or two. I imagine that he's one of the people who has a, a stronger sense of holography. So I'm looking forward to asking him about that and, and some other string theorists. But before I have that conversation, m this is the last question I have about this dimension of holography. But for those who do think that everything you and I are experiencing right now is a projection from this two-dimensional boundary, what sort of makes this volume a project like what is doing the projection or because the holograms that we're familiar with are kind of like illusions they're just sort of plays of of light maybe but there's really there's substance to this projection like what is what is bringing this to the interior of the sphere from from the outside well it is also the gravitational Field. I mean, if you have a mass, you can measure its gravitation by, by going further out. You can f feel the force. And so the same you can do with charges. Um, you can feel the electric field. And so one of the things we have learned is that we can even measure the mass or the charge by going to infinity and basically measure what's the electric field or what is the, the gravitational field there. And so everything in our universe also... Um, how should I say this? I mean, there's some way in which when something happens locally here, it's going to give a signal that goes to the boundary. And so somehow my the information of what I do in this space eventually will be, be reaching the boundary. And, and this reconstruction of what is happening inside the, the, the volume somehow used, uses sort of the inverse. I mean, you basically have to understand uh, how signals from the from the, the point in space goes to the boundary, and then you sort of well reconstruct that that from from the boundary. So there's some way that the the, the inside of a volume communicates with the boundary, uh, so that the information is basically projected on the boundary, and and we have to sort of go back and see what from what we can read off from the boundary what is really going on in the in the, in the inside. So this is this is kind of the language that people have tried to develop in how the the inside we we call this volume by the way the inside we call this the bulk it's sort of where where we are inside and we have the boundary and so there is a, a dictionary that translates things that go happen in the bulk namely in the, in the volume to things that happen on the boundary and, and that dictionary is is kind of what what we have been thinking about. Uh, and, and it's possible to make that translation, in particular toy models, I should say, which, which don't look like our universe. They are universes that, um, well, have, have no dark energy, for instance, in them. They're, they're, they are universes that, unlike our universe, are, have sort of a negative curvature. I mean, it means not, not curved in a positive way, but in a negative way. So those are special spaces where we can do this mapping from from the inside the volume to the boundary, and and we kind of understand it there mathematically, um, but we, we don't have a full translation yet. But but there is um, ways of understanding it there. Okay. Well, thank you for entertaining my questions about holography that took us a bit far afield. But now, finally, I think is the time for string theory to enter. So how does it connect with the holographic principle as it relates to black holes and help make sense of entropy and this information paradox? So string theory is a new idea that originated in the, in the early 70s uh, by thinking about 
the most elementary object, not as particles, but as little, tiny vibrating strings. Uh, so they are they don't like point like they really a little extend extended so they have a certain size and even if you excite them i mean they're like really vibrating strings and you can put more energy on a string by giving it excitations so it vibrates and it can get a little larger it's more like a little rubber band that also stretches a bit and so the more energy you put in the larger it becomes and that's sort of similar to what happens, by the way, to black holes, where if you also put more mass inside a black hole, it also gets gets larger. Now, what happened in, in the mid-90s is that we discovered that string theory not only has these little strings, it also can have objects that not not just one-dimensional, which strings are, are just one-dimensional vibrating objects, but maybe there are things that are, are more dimensional, even like two dimensions when we would call them a membrane or something like that. Yeah, brains. Brains. And brains. And so so th this uh, led to a whole new way of thinking about, well, objects in string theory that can be made together by putting these brains and strings in one object. And then you can imagine that there are many ways in which these strings and these brains can connect together uh, while we're making well, more brains on top of each other and then having more strings be, uh, between those brains. And it's basically, that's the way uh, that we eventually started to understand more what the microscopic uh, language is to describe black holes. I mean, so we had a um, development where we could think about those membranes uh, and, and, and strings put together as being actually equivalent to, to black holes in string theory. And then by counting the different ways of these strings and, and membranes together, uh, we found a, a, a match actually between what the black hole uh, area would be, the horizon area, and the amount of information that's associated to these micro states of these strings and, 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 and brains. So we made indeed the, the language, I mean, the map between the black hole area and the horizon area with the entropy, but then interpreted as, as counting the number of microstates or the microscopic possibilities uh, of the microscopic theory. So string theory showed that it was a capable of, of writing down the quantum mechanics of black holes in such a way that we could explain this entropy that Beckenstein and Hawking had, had uh, calculated. This, by the way, was work that was done by two of my colleagues at Harvard, uh, uh, Andy Strominger, who I know was also on your podcast, and uh, and, and Kumran Wafa. And, and, and they together and they gave a very beautiful explanation of the entropy of certain black holes with charge, I have to say. At that time, it was still in, in some uh, uh, larger dimension, five dimensions. They needed some extra dimensions for that. But eventually, we understood it in more cases, and also for these black holes in these these special universes with this negative curvature, we could also give an explanation. So, we in string theory, we have ways of explaining the the, the entropy of black holes by also making use of the fact that that string theory is more than just particles. It's also more than just strings. It has many more um, well things happening there we call this degrees of freedom in the sense that it, it, it's it's not just the matter that that went into the black hole that is uh, describing its entropy it's really everything that happens well how should i say is more microscopically in the language of these uh, these strings and these membranes and by the way if you think about then where these strings and membrane are, are situated they indeed become kind of large. The fact that string theory has extended objects, and as I said, if you put more energy in the string, they become bigger. That same happens to these membranes, and they basically have the, the size of the black hole. So there's some way that um, the, the, the extended objects that string theory is describing is also mapping onto the extension of the size of this black hole. So this is where the match also comes from. In, in explaining why there's uh, more information in a black hole than just the matter that goes in. This this question is is certainly not rigorous, but just how do you 
conceive of or visualize the core of a black hole? I mean, as a string theorist, do you just sort of visualize a a writhing ball of yarn and brains that is the composite of everything that was the star before it went supernova and that was subsequently sucked in by the hole? Is that just how you see that internal dense nugget? So what I see is what I mentioned that the matter that falls into the black hole eventually gets stuck. We don't see it ever disappearing behind the horizon. And and Hawking showed us that temperature that, that the black hole radiates. So the temperature of this object also becomes larger. I mean, there's some way that's a hot object. So I think about a black hole as some something where where all the the microscopic degrees of freedom are being excited and form something of that size. And I think about that as the brains and these strings sort of put together. So that some way this matter that was approaching the horizon and got stuck and, and got sort of mixed over the, the horizon area eventually gets put together in, in a well tangle of brains and strings on the horizon. And that's what, what how I think about the black hole. Of course, when I fall in, I will not be able to see all that stuff. I will just cross and fall into the horizon. And so what we are learning here is not just what black holes are made of, it's really what space-time itself is made of. So this is why why studying black hole is such an exciting uh, topic, because it's uh, telling us not just about black holes, it's telling us about space-time and, and, well, the microscopics of it, just like what we eventually learned for matter. I mean, matter, we eventually learned that it's made out of mo molecules and atoms and, and, and has fundamental building blocks. Now we're learning that space-time also has sort of fundamental building blocks, and and those uh, we we can understand in this string theory language. Hmm. No, this this is very interesting. So I understand that when we look at the black hole from the outside, we see the matter that went in sort of being imprinted there. But are you saying that you don't ever think about what the core of a black hole is like because all of that information is on the outside and that's all you need to think about to describe it? Yeah. That is exactly the way I think about it. I, I don't go, you don't go into the core of the black hole. Of course, as I said, when you fall into the black hole, you will be able to enter it. And then, then according to general relativity, what happens is that, well, you get, uh, feel a stronger uh, gravitational force that eventually becomes infinite at the center where you have a singularity. But that's not something that you can see from the outside, and it's also not a useful way of thinking about the black holes from the, from from the outside, and not the physics of it. I mean, the falling into the black hole is basically that you get absorbed by this hot gas of all the strings and, and brains, and that is what happens to you. Hmm. Is part of the reason that you don't want to think about the singularity is that we know that our theories don't accurately describe it. So quantum mechanics and general relativity break down there. Is that part of the reason why it's just not worth thinking about? Uh, excellent question. So there was a, a time when we thought that the only problem with general relativity was the fact that it has singularities. And, and um, Roger Penrose, who, who worked also with Hawking on, on theorems proving that black holes have, have singularities, those are the singularity theorem, and, and he, he earned a Nobel Prize for that. But he also had another uh, observation, which, which he couldn't prove, but so it became a conjecture, namely that every singularity inside a black hole is basically invisible. Uh, there's a horizon around it so that we cannot see it. He called this cosmic censorship. And so I think that's a fa fundamental idea, namely that from our, out our outside, the horizon is the end of space-time. It's not the singularity. It's from the outside, we don't see beyond the horizon. And in order to describe what's going on, we don't need to go all the way to the horizon. We have to go first to the, to the, sorry, to the singularity. We have to go to the horizon. So I think that this is actually what at Hoft was telling us already in, in, in the early 80s, 
uh, that indeed the, the, the answers to, to the questions about black holes were not by understanding the singularity, uh, but, but by understanding the horizon. And at that time, it seemed very weird because most people thought about the horizon as a very normal part of space-time. But nowadays, we understand that, that there is a way of thinking about the horizon as really the where all this quantum um well, physics is happening, and also where, where, well, you mentioned black holes as chaotic and 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 object. Actually, this is also why we think about horizons now: is that a lot of things are going on there that make them into something with very high entropy, but also with a lot of chaotic um, things happening in, in at the microscopic uh, level. So horizons are are not as as simple and 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 um, well n- nice objects that that, that uh, Einstein's theory would have told us, but they're really um, very complicated and, and, and chaotic uh, places of space-time. Hmm. Before we move on to entropic gravity, I have a couple of broader questions about what we've just been discussing. And you mentioned... Strominger and Waffe, uh, Strominger, whom I, I spoke with recently, and how they solved this major 25-year-old problem in cosmology of Bekenstein-Hawking radiation using string theory. And this problem for 25 years evaded solution by more conventional means like quantum field theory. And on the one hand, this seems like a super strong indication, not that there aren't others, but taken in isolation, that string theory is correct. <laughs> but it's also still conceivably not correct, as evidenced by many of the people who don't think string theory is the right theory of quantum gravity. But what I'm wondering is how it could have been so successful for solving problems like this but still be wrong. What are some of the possible scenarios? How might you explain string theory's immense effectiveness in physics if it is still wrong? Well, this was actually an insight that that I had um, already some time ago, is that that even... No, well, I I have to answer this question in several steps. Um, First of all, I agree with you that, that what string theory did uh, was amazing. I mean, it's a breakthrough. And it also told us that string theory has the right elements to explain this. So string theory, um, well, there are various ways of sort of thinking about what is string theory. People have written down a formulation of string theory that has 10 dimensions. It has uh, supersymmetry in it. it. It has a very specific way of, of well, having to compactify, I mean, taking those extra dimensions and roll them up and make them tiny so that we, we get our four-dimensional or three space and, and one time dimension out of that. And and that part, I think, may not be exactly correct, but that is not necessarily uh, telling us that, that uh, it's wrong. I mean, at, at least there may be other ways of using string theory or maybe extending it or using its, its principles so that we eventually get to the right theory. So I always think that string theory has the right elements, but it may not be the, the, the final uh, description. I mean, the, the description we have now may not be the final one. And and uh, there's ways of, um, well, explaining this a little more, more in detail. I mean, there's uh, now we have a very um, beautiful, actually, the most successful theory of, of, of uh, elementary particles and, and the fundamental forces is the standard model. Uh, that is indeed described in quantum field theory. But there are many, many quantum field theories. I mean, quantum field theory is, is a framework which can have many realizations. So the standard model is one particular one where we write down a particular set of particles. Uh, we, we have a particular set of forces, but it's, it's, it's not say, the most symmetric one. For instance, there's no supersymmetry in, in the standard model. We could have written down a supersymmetric model. 
we could have even written down a model that has so much supersymmetry that, that all the calculations that we would do in the standard model would be finite without ever sort of having to do all the tricks that we now have to apply, the ones that, that Hoft invented. So, I mean, that Hoff basically showed us how to, to remove infinities, for instance, from, from our calculations. But there is a very beautiful formulation which has supersymmetry, but it's not our world. And so string theory can have the same problem, that we have added so much symmetry to it in its current form that it may not be our world. So one of the the ways we have to sort of extend it is to, to think about more general formulations of string theory, which has fewer symmetries uh, and maybe, uh, well, therefore, well, maybe kind of a little bit of a different theory than what we are thinking it's now. But its principles are correct in the same way that it's sort of, I, I think about it also as a framework that has many more realizations. And so what I, I have learned from string theory is indeed the way to think about uh, the microscopic um, description of black holes, for instance, but also more generally about how to think about these molecules of space-time. And I think the lessons we've learned from string theory should be taken seriously. This is where I think my approach indeed sort of differs from what Hof nowadays is also still thinking about and maybe other people that think about quantum gravity. But if, the, if you're ignoring what's going on in string theory and what we have learned from it, you're probably ignoring a very important lesson that we should incorporate in our final description of what quantum gravity is. But whether that is string theory, yes or no, we don't know. And, and maybe it's good to mention that now, uh, right at this moment, we are having meetings. Uh, one is happening in, in Santa Barbara, which is about the question, what is string theory? And, and so many people working in string theory have not fully uh, agreed yet about what is string theory. So we have not found the final formulation. So I think most people, and certainly the younger people that have entered this, this field, would probably agree that, that the formulation that people took, say, in the 70s and early 80s of string theory may not be the, the final one and that we need more ingredients or, or have to combine it with, with our our current understanding of black holes because certainly in the last decade I think the, the whole emphasis of our, our research has not been so much on string theory but more on, on thinking about the question of black holes and their entropy. Hmm. Just to reiterate and make sure that I'm on the same page. So when you say that the success of string theory in solving problems like Bekenstein Hawking radiation, it suggests that strings, brains, these are here to stay, the principles, but which Kalabi Yao shapes correspond to the extra dimensions, what symmetries there are, the relations between like the various string theories like heterotic E and O and so on, these things still there's room for development and we don't have the final theory yet. But you think that point particles, for instance, are gone and strings have replaced them, strings and brains. Uh, yes and no. I mean, one way I, I would formulate it is that, that maybe by, by thinking about black holes, we're also thinking about different principles and that we're going to eventually connect them to what we will learn from string theory. I mean, there's some way I believe that we can even eventually derive something like string theory from, from other principles. So the idea that string theory has to start from the assumption that you replace particles by strings, that already assumes that we know what a particle is or what a string is, and that's assuming something about space and time. So the thing we have learned now in string theory is that we first have to ask the question, what is space and time itself made of, before we even ask the question about what are the, the fundamental particles made of. That's something, a, a, a next uh, thought. So our... our way of thinking about the microscopic formulation of the, the, the world, I mean, even this holographic uh, idea we talked about, is not about space and time. So even in this holographic uh, description, say, of a uh, part of space where we put the information on the boundary, we're not talking about the strings. I mean, that's something that should appear in, in, the, in the space 
uh, as excitations of certain objects. So the starting point may be a different one than than we have used uh, earlier on in string theory. But a string theory will eventually be embedded or or incorporated in this whole uh, well way we're gonna think about quantum gravity. Okay, well, this uh, first chapter of our conversation has been uh, terrific. I'm, I'd like to turn now, though, to some of your major contributions to physics and cosmology. And we've spoken a, a great deal about entropy so far. And one of your theories is known as entropic gravity. So first, I think I should just ask, I mean, what is the connection between entropy and gravity? What was discovered by, by Hawking and Bekenstein is that there's a deep connection between the horizon area and bl- uh, entropy, but also that, that the laws of gravity, basically, near black holes, look like the laws of thermodynamics. Um, so the laws of thermodynamics, we know how to derive. I mean, they're not fundamental uh, laws. I mean, we have uh, ways of understanding this as, well, arising from the statistical average from all the molecules that are making up, say, a gas. If I have a, a gas of a certain temperature, the temperature is basically a measure of the, the amount of energy per molecule or something like that. And the pressure is something to do with the velocity, how, how, how particles bounce against the wall or something like that. But there's a statistical explanation of all these numbers. And the laws of thermodynamics can be derived from statistical physics. Now, the laws of gravity look like those laws of thermodynamics. So you may wonder how, uh, well, maybe that then also can be derived from thinking about something more microscopic. And so what I proposed in this paper, uh, which I wrote about 12 or 13 years ago, uh, on, on the origin of gravity and the laws of Newton, is there I made the point that the way we have now found connection from gravity with entropy, that maybe we should turn that around, that we should start from the entropy and then derive a gravity from it. So the insight that I had in that paper was that changes in entropy, as I said, they can be associated to changes in energy. And if you change the energy, one way to do it is by having a force acting and, and having, well, acting it on a particle. If you displace a particle when the force is acting it, you change its energy. So, so I, I basically showed there that, that a change in entropy can lead to a, a change in energy and then to a force. And that's the way we should think about the gravitational force. Or actually, if you think about it in, in the way that, that Einstein described, it's not even the, the force due to gravity, it's even the inertial force that we are experiencing that should be explained in that way. So even the law F equals MA, the, the, the first law of Newton, can then be sort of derived from this, uh, well, starting from entropy. So this is what, what eventually became known as entropic gravity. That name was not invented by me, but I think that the way I, I kind of like to explain it is that, that I say that entropy or the microscopic entropy that's in the, in the space time is the starting point and, and that we should then derive gravity from it or even derive, well, what we can now call space and time. So space and time themselves should be seen then as something that, that become what, what I would call emergent from a more microscopic uh, description. So this idea of emergence kind of is very central to this um, whole uh, theory of entropic gravity, is that you start from the entropy and then derive the gravitational laws instead of uh, the other way around. Hmm. Okay, so I'd like to dig into a number of things you said in more detail. And the first thing that comes to mind is that you said the laws of thermodynamics are not fundamental. So they're they're emergent, they come from statistical averages. And just to contrast this with something else so that we have a better understanding of what you're saying gravity isn't, can you give me an example of a canonical fundamental law that doesn't emerge from statistics? Uh, that's a very uh, hard question maybe to answer because I personally feel that everything that we 
eventually write down as laws of nature, in some sense should be thought of as emergent. Okay. I don't think that, I don't think that as humans we will find fundamental laws. This is kind of more like a, a philosophical yeah. point of view that I have. But um, uh, it certainly, when I was starting uh, my physics study, we, we had uh, the standard model that was just found and the language of what we called elementary particles and fundamental forces sort of implied that those particles are the most elementary building blocks. They cannot be divided any further. Those forces cannot be derived from anything else. And so people were kind of suggesting that they got to the, the, the most fundamental building blocks of nature. Now, I think that language of particles and forces eventually is going to be replaced by a, a new language from which we can derive it. And that new language, I, I would call then the, the, inf the language of information or well, if you count how much information there is, that there's some way that entropy then then enters. Um, so the um, the new angle of the new approach I was proposing is indeed to start from a, a more fundamental language than particles and forces in terms of entropy, and then derive those um, forces and particles from that. Um, and but as you say, I mean, in, in in thermodynamics, if I would think about the molecules and 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 the way they they behave, uh, that can be is more fundamental than the laws of thermodynamics. So there's some way that you go to a deeper layer. Uh, that the, in the case of thermodynamics, we know that that the laws of thermodynamics are derived from the laws of how particles are are moving and interacting in a gas. But eventually, those can be explained maybe from something that's underlying that as well. So there's always a deeper layer, but then the, the one that you are explaining from that is then the emergent set of uh, laws. Hmm. So entropy emerges from other laws, and it, it's something like an empirical contingency based on observations that entropy increases something that i don't understand though is why the law of gravity looks like those of thermodynamics because maybe it just comes from the picture i have of the standard particle model and the idea that gravitons might somehow be incorporated there that gravity is just like the other three forces I guess what I'm wondering is I just don't really understand why gravity is should be thought of as emergent based on those of thermodynamics. Is it so? So just to be clear, I mean I'm not saying that gravity emerges from these other forces. One thing I mean, so these other forces are not more fundamental than gravity. That's one thing. Okay. Uh, so, because I think gravity is special because it's uh, connected to space and time. So, uh, the fact that we think about uh, gravity in the language of, of um, Einstein as the curvature of space and time uh, makes it so, so much different. I mean, these other forces are not connected to, to space and time. And and But just to give you a little bit of an intuition of how I think about um, this connection between the gravitational force and um, and entropy. Um, so Einstein taught us that mass curves space and time. And, and one way to measure the curvature, we talked about the volume and the area. If I have a certain volume, it, it, it grows like the, the cube of the radius, and the area also grows in a certain way. Uh, now what happens when I put a mass inside I'm changing a bit of the, the entropy because of the first law of uh, thermodynamics. And because the change in energy also gives a change in entropy. So that indeed happens, actually, that when I have a volume and I put a mass inside, I'm actually changing the amount of area that uh, that would bound that, that volume. And, and that change of the relationship between the area and the volume is exactly what is expressed by the curvature of space-time. So one way to think about curvature of space-time is that the relationship that we 
normally know between volume and area is no longer true. And so uh, there is a direct way, even in, in some very short a uh, few equations that we need to write down that that helps us even calculate by how much um, the space time is the space is curved if we put a mass inside a, a certain volume. So this is at least the way I, I showed it in that paper, and um, so I, I I don't think I can help you further because I I think about gravitons as as again not something that is fundamental, and maybe the analogy I should make here is that. Uh, even in, in a solid, uh, I mean, we have waves, uh, I mean, there are sound waves. We can have particles associated with them. We call them phonons, uh, if we, we think about them quantum mechanically. But they're not fundamental. They, they derive from the sound waves. And sound waves are just, well, ways in which the molecules inside a, a solid are, are moving around uh, due to the forces inside the solid. So I can eventually explain this, these, these sound waves more microscopically, but nevertheless, I can think about them in some particle-like way. And the same is true for the, the waves that we see in space-time. Those are the gravitational waves. Uh, they have, uh, when we quantize them, also a particle associated to them, the graviton. But I don't think about that graviton as a fundamental particle. Uh, because the way I can derive it is is in the same way that I can think about um, sound waves. I can derive it from the, the the microscopics of what happens inside the space time uh, from this more more fundamental underlying language uh, of information. So particles for me are not uh, the fundamental objects, and the same is true for gravitons. They're they're not fundamental particles. Hmm. As you mentioned, I think earlier, and as I mentioned, so much of your work, and this included, connects back to black holes. And quantum entanglement, I understand, is integral to Hawking radiation and so connected to the entropy of black holes. Am I right that it's also important to entropic gravity? Yes. I mean, the, the yeah, we, we left that out from our discussion so far. Uh, what Hawking discovered, indeed, is that, that black holes emit radiation, but the way that happens is that there are some fluctuations, uh, quantum due to quantum fluctuations of the vacuum that allow particles to be sort of created in pairs. This has to do with the uncertainty in the energy. If you look at a very short time, uh, there can be a little bit of energy that can be created from the vacuum that allows two particles, say a particle and an antiparticle, to be created. Now, if you have a black hole, then one of these particles can actually fall into the black hole and the other particle can tra travel outwards. But the properties of these particles are related. I mean, if one has a positive charge, the other one has a negative charge. If one has to spin up, the other one must have a spin down. And quantum mechanically, it means that these are entangled. So uh, there's entanglement carried by those particles. Now. Every part of space has these particles in them. We call them virtual particles that can create and they can eventually also disappear. But it also tells us that even empty space has this possibility, but also has this entanglement of, um, well, two sides, say, of, of uh, the space-time. I mean, I can even think about our room here. I mean, you are sitting there, but anyway, if I think about just a normal room, there's some way that the horizon of a black hole looks like the space-time in our room. Uh, it's even possible to create artificially a horizon here. If you keep accelerating in one direction, uh, there's some way that uh, light cannot reach you anymore because if you travel away from me, I, I cannot reach you anymore with, with a, a light signal. So that, that point that, that I cannot do this anymore might be just around here. So then this part of space might actually become the horizon of an accelerated observer. And so here we have even some entanglement in space. And this is what I kind of use also in my description of, of entropic gravity, is that I thought about uh, choosing an area somewhere. So if I take space and divide it into two, I have a right and a left. Uh, then there's entanglement between the right and the left. 
and you can count how much entanglement you have. Basically, uh, if I have a spin up here and a spin down there or the other way around, that is one bit of information that is then entangled. And the amount of entanglement can just be counted, therefore, also by an entropy. We call this entanglement entropy. It turns out that that entanglement entropy is also given exactly by the area of this surface. And so if you ask what was the entropy that I talked about in, in my paper on entropic gravity, it is the entanglement entropy that is in space time. So the notion of entanglement is kind of crucial in all of this, and it's one of the, well, main uh, features actually of, of, of quantum mechanics. The, the, the fact that quantum mechanics allows us to have probabilities when we measure something that we don't know exactly what is the outcome, that also means that there's this possibility of entanglement. And, and that is essential in understanding what, what uh, um, well, this entropy means. And even, and this is sort of how we now think about um, this in, 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 in our field, is namely that this entanglement between the left and the right-hand side of the room is actually the reason why the left and the right side are kind of connected to each other. I mean, you might even ask, I mean, why does, if I cut the space in two, why does the right-hand side know that it's connected to the left-hand side of the, the space? Well, it's because the two are entangled. They sort of stitch together uh, by entanglement. Sort of comparable to what you have, say, in, in, in a solid. If I have a solid, uh, like a table or whatever, why does the right-hand side know that it's connected to the left-hand side? I mean, it's the molecules that sort of bound together, there, there are chemical bonds, and there's some way that they are connected by, by something that, that keeps them together. Now, in space-time, that what keeps space-time together is this quantum entanglement uh, of, say, the two parts of space that uh, are connected. Something that I'm still missing is how the entanglement specifically connects to gravity. So I'm, I'm trying to explain what space-time is made up because, I mean, uh, saying space-time is made out of entanglement. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the entropy is described by the area uh, of, say, the two parts of space. Mm -hmm. Then you can ask, um, well, in what unit? In that unit, we have to put in the Planck scale, and the Planck scale knows about Newton's concept. So the amount of entanglement determines basically what Newton's constant is. I see. And now my uh, formulation of gravity as emergent is that you should start from this entanglement, then apply laws of thermodynamics, and then you derive the laws of gravity. So I've not assumed gravity. I'm going to derive it. I see. So gravity is not, put in, is not put in. The reason why there's gravity is the fact that this entanglement is finite. So the fact that I can measure the amount of entanglement and that's given by the area in Planck units, that leads to gravity. So I, I'm not assuming there's gravity. This is what, what my whole paper was about. Let's forget about, think about a microscopic world where there's no gravity. We're going to derive gravity, just like we're deriving the, the laws of thermodynamics. We're going to derive what the gravitational force is, and we're going to derive everything that we know about, um, well, inertia and, and gravity together. And basically, Einstein's theory should, uh, of relativity should then follow as, as a consequence of the fact that we start from this um, assumption, basically, that the entanglement is given by the area in, in Planck uh, units. And so it's because gravity is derived, derived, that's the key word from something more simple, the entanglement entropy. That is why it's emergent and not fundamental. That's right. That's right. Okay, great. And I, I would like to get back to this in a minute, but first I have a couple of questions about string theory and entanglement. And this 
might be kind of a naive question, but I'm sure our listeners who don't know the answer to this will also be curious. But what I'm what I'm hearing then is that string theory is also totally subject to the entanglement that we're familiar with from quantum mechanics. String theory isn't in any way a path to get away from spooky action at a distance. No, that was certainly not part of it because string theory started from a quantum mechanical theory. Actually, I said there was this assumption about particles made up of strings. And the beautiful thing in string theory is that uh, then we can also kind of derive gravity because gravity becomes associated to the excitations of one of those uh, strings. Um, but the the important thing with string theory is that it, it never replaced uh, quantum mechanics by anything else. Uh, so uh, string theory accepts quantum mechanics as totally correct and, and everything that we know about quantum mechanics like entanglement and so on is also part of string theory. Right, no, that makes total sense because uh, if I'm recalling correctly, string theory, though it of course iterated many times, it emerged from trying to model the string force, or I mean the, the strong force as string. So it emerged from within the standard particle model. But this raises though another question. I mean, within quantum mechanics, there are many different interpretations that seek to make sense in various ways of such unintuitive features of quantum mechanics as entanglement. And I'm wondering, because I've never heard about this before, if these interpretations, so I mean, Bohmian mechanics, many worlds, and so on, if they carry over to string theory, like, is there a is there a vibrant foundations of string theory community? Or does string theory have its own canonical way of explaining why strings are entangled? So the, the interpretation of quantum mechanics, actually all of them have to do with how we can reconcile quantum mechanics with our classical experience in our classical world. And so we have normally some way of translating uh, the quantum description into our classical experience, which has to do with measurements and, and the probability of a certain outcome. So this whole discussion about the interpretation of quantum mechanics has to do more with the interpretation of our classical world. So string theorists, to be honest, they think the world is quantum mechanical. Uh, and so the, the world, uh, we don't have this, we don't think that this interpretation issue actually plays a role in how we do quantum mechanics. It's kind of what um, Feynman said. I mean, with quantum mechanics, we know how to calculate and, and we calculate and, and don't ask questions. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of how we also deal with it within string theory. So the interpretation issue is not an, uh, uh, yeah, something that we think about. Although one thing that I have to say where it becomes kind of important is that when we try to apply quantum mechanics, say, to the entire universe, I mean, then you have to start thinking about what it means to have these probabilities and so on. And, and maybe this is where string theorists eventually have to enter into this uh, more interpretation question. But suddenly it has not played an important role in, in our, our research so far. Uh, and I don't think also that string theory has uh, a lot to say actually at this point, uh, which of those different interpretations might be correct. I mean, the role of entanglement, by the way, is important. And actually, this is also something that has played quite an important role in some of those interpretation aspects. I mean, one way to think about why the world looks classical also is to think about entanglements and, and things like what we call decoherence and so on. So there, there's lots of uh, overlap, but not, not something that, that has become an important discussion point about this uh, interpretation uh, question. Okay, thank you. Because I've been I've been wondering about this for quite some time, and that's quite helpful. And now, I mean, for the the last time, we for the rest of the time we have today, I wanted to continue talking about entropic gravity. But now that we have it 
we have the basics under our belt. I want to talk about its implications going, well, its implications for cosmology more broadly, but also how it fares going forward. And the first thing that comes to mind is that we already have a very successful theory of gravity, and that's general relativity. So how does entropic gravity compare, maybe as far as its predictive power is concerned, to general relativity? Well, general relativity is a very successful theory. It has indeed predicted lots of uh, things. I mean, about uh, starting with the perihelion shift of mercury, bending of light, uh, um, black holes, they exist, uh, gravitational waves. Even uh, the fact that our universe is dynamical can be understood in general relativity. It's a theory that's already more than a century old. I mean, uh, so there's some way that eventually we're going to replace it with something new because it doesn't combine very well with quantum mechanics. So entropic gravity is something that we are, well, how should I say, it's a proposal that is sort of in the first uh, step and we're not there that we have a final theory that there. And I also would like to connect it to everything that's happening in our field more broadly. These ideas about entanglement, for instance, they, they have been proposed also by other people, I think by notably by, by Van Ram, uh, Mark van Ramsonk. Lenny Suskind has done important work in, in these directions, and Malasena, of course. And so the whole idea of connecting quantum information, for instance, to gravity, I would sort of put together in, in my way of thinking about uh, entropic gravity or emergent gravity. And that, I think, approaches the the problem of what is cosmology and, and how we should think about space-time in a very different way than general relativity. So I hope that, that this new way of thinking about it can answer questions that general relativity cannot. And, and so there are problems that uh, we'd like to sort of, well, understand better. I mean, one of them is is this mysterious uh, dark energy that we are observing in our universe. Um, we don't have even an explanation yet in, in, in string theory, for instance, of how to describe uh, a universe with dark energy in it. And this is also where I feel that the whole uh, subject of emergent gravity needs to be understood better. I mean, we know quite well uh, now how to derive uh, Einstein's equations in this other universe that has negative curvature. It's called anti sitter space, if uh, to, to mention the name. But but our universe has a positive uh, energy and a positive curvature, and and would be called the sitter space if you think about it. That that's the opposite of anti sitter space, and certain things might be different. Uh, one of the things that's different in this this universe we live in is that because it's expanding. Uh, things are moving away from us, and they're moving even faster when they're further away. So there's a certain distance where things are starting to move away from our uh, Earth and, and, and our, our gal galaxy by, by more than the speed of light. And that means that we cannot send signals anymore, and they disappear from our view. It's basically we have, again, a horizon. We call this the cosmological horizon. So our universe very much like a black hole, has a horizon, and that horizon also has an entropy and a temperature just like black holes have. So th that is what makes uh, an expanding universe different from the universe that was used in string theory in this holographic uh, correspondence. So we should be able to now ex take what we learned from string theory and, and from this holographic uh, ideas and put that in now in a in in the real universe and and there I think that that uh, the whole ideas about emergent gravity may still work but the the implications might be different and especially the the um, the questions about what is dark energy and and what we are observing in galaxies and so on uh, might be be uh, well coming in a different light. I'd like to come back to the to dark energy in a moment, but return to where we began. And you mentioned some of the accomplishments of general relativity. So Mercury or explaining Mercury's perihelion, predicting 
gravitational lensing, gravitational waves, and so on. How has entropic gravity compared or has it does it account for these things that general relativity already accounts for? Yes, that should be in there. I mean, uh, so general relativity differs from Einstein's Newton's theory when when the gravitational fields become very strong. So what I uh, worked on is actually indeed a proposal for how immersion gravity would work in a universe with dark energy in it. And then you will find that uh, when you take into account that there is this horizon, that there might be deviations uh, from general relativity when the gravitational field is very weak. And that happens, for instance, in, in, in galaxies. Um, if we look at galaxies, uh, they also rotate very much like uh, the solar system does. And just like the planets are moving around the sun, the, the stars are moving around the center of this, this galaxy. But the speeds by, by which they do this uh, don't follow the pattern that we would have expected by Newtonian or, or, or Einstein's laws. They're going actually much faster. And the way that people try to explain this now is by assuming that there's much more matter there than we are observing. This is called the dark matter. And so what I uh, propose is that there's some other way of explaining this that comes from, well, thinking about gravity as an emergence uh, force, uh, where it even connects to what happens in our, our universe, that we have this horizon and, and its associated temperature. Uh, so I indeed wrote down um, um, equations that kind of describe this. Um, actually, it connects to also other ideas that have been proposed by a uh, particular Milgram, who proposed a, a, a modification of Newtonian laws that can be uh, compared also to experiments. So there are experiments we can do, observations, I should say, uh, of, of galaxies that allow us to test, um, well, the, these uh, laws. But I have to add here that, that I don't think that, that we have found the full derivation or the, 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 the full understanding of this, this, um, these laws yet in, in generality. Uh, so uh, I think it's a little early to say that we can already make very specific predictions that need to be tested. But at least the, the, the general um, idea, that, and there are some laws that we can test, uh, for instance, for instance, for galaxies, we have indeed uh, made some predictions for what happens when you go even further out, uh, outside of uh, where, where the stars are no longer visible. And I have a colleague, uh, an astronomer in Groningen, who has done measurements together with um, students uh, from here, and actually a postdoc, uh, Marco Bauer, who has done observations that um, indeed verify this, this predicted behavior. I wouldn't call this yet a, a full proof of a theory because, as I said, the theory is still in development, and uh, but it's at least indicative of, of what is well, possible. And so when the theory is further along, we might actually have observational um, predictions to make that can be tested with, with uh, well, observations in our cosmos. One of the criticisms of string theory that you hear all the time is that it's unfalsifiable in the sense that every time it runs into a problem, like it predicts the mass of some particle to be many orders of magnitude larger than uh, measurements indicate it is, then the theorists just rejigger the theory and make it work. And so in this sense, it's unfalsifiable. But that always, that criticism has never made much sense to me because of course, if you're developing a theory, it is highly unlikely that the final theory is just going to fall right into your lap. I mean, I don't think that that happens very often. It is an iterative process. So is that generally how you feel about entropic gravity at this point? If there is a prediction that doesn't, pan out or some observation doesn't match or mesh with theory, that just means that the theory needs to be iterated. It doesn't mean that it's wrong because you have faith that the intuition is correct. Yes. I, I think for string theory, of course, there were two phases actually maybe of the theory. One where it tried to make predictions about elementary particles and their forces. 
But the other one where we sort of now in is where we think more about the gravitational side of things and indeed about black holes and white horizons and eventually cosmology. That theory is not fully developed yet, but I feel that that side of it may, can make predictions. But we, as you say, we're not at that stage yet. And so when people say, well, we're going to fals falsify entropic gravity or emergent gravity or even string theory at that level, I think they are running ahead of the game because we have not made a full... Our theory is not finished yet. And also, uh, this whole information paradox that sort of came out of Hawking's uh, puzzle of black holes, I mean, the, the Hawking radiation and so on, eventually will lead us to understand gravity better and the quantum mechanics. And when, once we do that, I believe we can make predictions that can be uh, falsified. So I, I do think that string theory eventually, in the way at least I think about it, produces a falsifiable theory precisely in the area of cosmology or understanding what the early universe was about. And and that's where the, the biggest questions still are, and this is where we try to find answers. Hmm. And then you you already discussed dark energy, and dark matter is another major puzzle in cosmology since it's supposed to make up the bulk well with dark energy the bulk of our universe's mass but we have no idea what it is what is the the current well i think that the the current paradigm is that dark matter is some sort of particle that's what the general received view is so i mean i just had a discussion with an astrophysicist who told me if i cut my hands, I've probably got 10 particles of dark matter in there right now. But I understand that that's not how you think of dark matter. And if I'm correct, that dark matter might not actually be matter at all. Maybe you could, if I'm right, you could spell that out for me and explain just how entropic gravity would have us conceive of dark matter or what we observe as dark matter. So um, you're right that, that now people think that dark matter is some kind of particle, but what we actually observed is, is a deviation from the gravitational laws that we can then sort of fix by adding more matter. But there's another way maybe, namely that the gravitational laws are slightly different. Now, dark matter and dark energy are different things. Dark energy has to do with the expansion of the universe. It's some kind of, well energy that's evenly distributed over space and it causes the the universe to expand faster now they they usually thought about as two different things uh, what i uh, want to uh, propose and actually i did propose in, in my paper on emergent gravity namely that um, there's a connection between the dark energy and and the amount of dark uh, matter that seems to be there so i want to explain this deviation from the einstein theory in a different way by the fact that there is dark energy. Now, one way uh, uh, this you can visualize this is that, that um, uh, the, the universe also has an entropy, namely associated to its um, horizon that we have. We have a cosmological horizon because the universe expands. But the reason why it's there is that there's also dark energy. So I think, and this is what I proposed, is that this entropy is associated to this dark energy. So the dark energy is everywhere, and also this entropy, therefore, can be everywhere. And and that actually, the presence of that entropy is, is what makes this universe different, for instance, from this negatively curved universe. And it also may change the laws of gravity because it basically creates an additional force. So when we have a galaxy in, in our universe, it's surrounded also by this entropy of the, the, the dark energy. And it's the additional, you can almost call it the pressure that's due to that dark energy that creates the additional force. I mean, I, I can say much more about it, but, but this is kind of the way you can visualize this, is that, that the additional entropy due to dark energy is actually responsible for the amount of extra force. And, and nicely, actually, it also explains also the precisely where the deviations uh, start appearing. Namely, what happens in galaxies is that initially the, the 
the stars are rotating exactly with the speed that we might follow from from Newtonian or, or Einstein's theory, but it's only at a certain distance, or be, be, better said, it's at a certain gravitational acceleration where things start to deviate. And this is explained precisely by this connection with the dark energy. And so I find it rather compelling that dark energy and dark matter are now part of the same uh, story. And so we don't assume that dark matter is some unknown particle because that would not have taught us anything about dark energy. I think that the problem of dark energy and dark matter are really about the same uh, aspect of, of our universe and that, that they somehow are part of the same theory. Uh, but also, indeed, with also explaining what, what gravity is about. So gravity, dark energy, and dark matter somehow can be explained together in, in our cosmos in a way that, that uh, they fit together. Hmm. So dark matter, as currently conceived, as particles, is supposed to be, uh, they're supposed to be extremely heavy particles. And so the the way that we might observe them is in a particle collider that can accelerate particles to very high energies and thus produce them. But of course, on your view, this isn't going to work because dark matter isn't particles. But what this makes me wonder then is how on your theory, we come to observe or measure or detect dark matter, what we think of now as dark matter and dark energy is it an experiment or is it just further refinement of theory so what when the theory is is developed to the point that we can indeed predict what's going on in in galaxies when uh for instance when they are colliding or whether they are are moving i mean there are certain things that that galaxies are doing where we at current, we, we can think about this dark matter particle and try to model it. But maybe we have now with our, our if we have a new theory, we can make predictions about what happened. So I think the way we're going to make uh, the falsifiable statements is also by comparing to observations. But it's observations of the gravitational dynamics of galaxies or, or larger objects. So I don't think that, that we have an Earth-based experiment that, that can find these particles uh, if they're not there, first of all. But dark matter is not something that is associated to a particle, in my view, and it's something that has to do with the way that gravity works in, in situations where we have, uh, well, very small accelerations. We have to really go very far out in, in our cosmos to see these effects or in our galaxy. Uh, there may be predictions that are, are closer to home, but, but then I would say within our galaxy, not, not within our, say, solar system. And certainly not, not a, a tabletop or, or some detector that's going to find it. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the theory makes no predictions. It's, it's more in the observations that we can do in these uh, cosmological astrophysical settings. Hmm. So as as we finish, I'm I'm just wondering what has the what has been the reception of entropic gravity? You mentioned some very well known string theorists like Maldacena and, and Suskin who are who have worked on it and contributed to it, but is it in the broader string theoretic community something that is accepted at this point or that a lot of effort is being put toward? Is it being heavily researched? Okay, so entropic gravity, in, in, as a word, I mean, was given to the, the particular theory that I proposed, um, but I think that was also taken out of context a little bit by, I have to say, also the science journalists and so on. The the initial reaction was somewhat, um, how should I say, uh, people wanted to wait and see, kind of. Um, but at the same time, as I said, there's a development about this entanglement aspects and so on. So I see my theory as sort of put together with this other way of thinking about emergence of gravity. So the idea that gravity is emergent, I think now becomes much more generally accepted. And that entropy and quantum entanglement are central to that is also now fully accepted. 
I see this as an acceptance of these central ideas of entropic gravity, and and this is this development is going on. So I, I certainly envisaged uh, the the developments that were were happening, have happened, been happening, but also which are happening because we are still making progress, and and even now, we're working on on new ideas about this and quantum entanglement that go very much in the direction of my original paper, and uh, so I feel that that those ideas are now part of the mainstream, but uh, the way that credit is being distributed is not a, uh, well, that's also d determined by sociology. So I don't think that people will call this entropic gravity, but the way that it might be called emergent gravity, I think eventually yes, but that word is not being used uh, very much now, I have to say, but it's, I think, an idea that slowly gets more uh, accepted. Okay, so maybe one way of putting this would be to compare it to the reception of, or and future of string theory that we discussed earlier, where the success, for instance, with Bekenstein-Hawking radiation and other problems indicates that the principles of string theory are here to stay. And at this point, even though the theory of what we'll refer to now as emergent gravity is evolving the principle itself that gravity is emergent you think is is here to stay within that's strength. right and, and i think one of the bigger questions is how we can bring together those principles from string theory and the principles that we have now learned from emergent gravity into one framework and it certainly seems now that if you read the papers and so on that they're almost two different sides of of a coin without knowing that they are really connected. I mean, we feel that we have found two sides of a story, but we don't know yet how to bring them together. And, and this is sort of where the exciting, uh, and exciting developments will happen in, 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 the, in the future. Okay, Eric. Well, this was absolutely terrific. I'm glad that we got to, we got to discuss two issues in great detail. And I really learned a lot. I know that my our listeners are going to learn a lot too. So thanks so much for your time and sharing your expertise. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Airhome.